Hello, my name is Jodie Brunning. You're listening to PSTR and today we're talking to Dr. Jen Unwin. Dr. Jen Unwin's expertise is in clinical psychology. She's a chartered clinical and health psychologist and she has worked for 30 years at the NHS in the UK. She's also got a PhD. Um, and she specialised in hope in quality of life. She was chair of the UK Association for Solution Focused Therapy, and she's a co-founder, and this is where she spends a lot of her time now, with Food Addiction Solutions in the UK. And that's under the auspices, if you're searching on the internet with the um, collaborative health community. So thank you, Jen, for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Jen, your work over many years has been in a voluntary capacity with your husband, David, Dr. David Unwin, at the Norwood Surgery, his clinical practice in Southport. Southport. And since 2013, he's offered a low-carb diet to patients with type 2 diabetes. And every Monday there was a support group. And can you, so can you tell us about what you, what this involved and what your work involved what your work was here yeah totally yeah it's been i mean it's it's been life changing for us as, as well as as a lot of the patients really to to do this work it sort of came about because um it's very hard work being a general practitioner in in the uk and and david was getting a bit uh down in the dumps about it really about the, you know the fact that people were getting sicker and sicker and there were more and more patients with diabetes so he was you know feeling a bit fed up about that um also at the same time i'd personally because i've got a kind of personal journey not with diabetes but with with food addiction carb addiction particularly and i'd um uh, learned about low carbohydrate diets and was doing sort of super well so anyway this this idea evolved that you know why don't we put our skills together which we'd never done in the past we'd never actually worked together professionally and try and help people with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes at his practice to do something a little bit different. Let's just see what happens kind of thing um, as a bit of a bit of a project. And yeah, we started because the practice weren't very keen and there was no money available. We just did it in the evenings as as volunteers. It has it is now thoroughly embedded in the practice and all the partners are, you know, on board, the practice nurses and, and everybody. So it's it, it, it it's now much more sort of practice wide project yeah so so we start with 18 people in a pilot group we just messaged all the people with our uh, pre-diabetes and said you know were you interested and we got a really really good response and though that was that was the first paper that we published and we couldn't believe the results david thought you know people will think that we're total frauds because we were doing so so well you know that if people with pre-diabetes adopt this low carbohydrate diet it's like you know practically everybody is is going to normalize their blood sugars so um then he he um he got someone to help with the stats you know i'd written a few academic papers before but he'd never written an academic paper so that was how that was how it it all began and then of course we had to keep going so now there's lots of data about lots of patients over 11 years so it's it, it as you say it's a unique data set really into internationally and that first first um, <clears throat> trial was only over an eight month period, and um, and what's interesting is that the cholesterol improved despite the eggs and butter diet. So that was that's pretty fabulous for a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, that was eggs and butter kept the data because people were saying you know this is dangerous what you're doing people's cholesterol is going to go through the roof you're going to give them a heart attack in fact the, the dietitian who at the time was assigned to the practice just left she she didn't want anything to do with it what we were doing at all so we thought oh gosh we really need to be super careful we need to monitor all of all of those um kind of parameters of people's health really check we aren't doing them any harm and that and that's why we have this sort of fantastic data set with all the cholesterol and the blood pressures and the kidney function and all of that and and part of that was that the patients wouldn't go hungry mm. i mean that that's one characteristic um report really from people when we give them the the the, the diet sheets not really a diet but this sort of way of eating sheet um and they you know they managed to adopt it 
um, it's just such a common report that, well, it's amazing because I just don't feel hungry. I'm just eating less because I'm yeah. not hungry all day long, which they were previously on this kind of, you know, uh, blood sugar roller coaster that people people are on. And then in 2020, you released um, what, what's called Insights from a General Practice Service Evaluation, supporting a lower carbohydrate diet in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and prediabetes. And, and so that was released. And, and can you remember what that, that talked about? Yeah, so, so we got bolder then after the first paper, which was about the people with prediabetes. Obviously, we got bolder and um, patients in the practice had heard, because it's a sort of small local community, uh, people were asking if they could, <laughs> you know, do, the, do this new thing. So we had more, uh, way, way, way more data to report about the and patients. that might have helped with the culture change and with the clinicians. Because I think that a lot of the time in the past, doctors have thought, oh, no, no, they don't want to change. People don't want to change their diet. Mm, no, so that's, yeah, totally. Totally. That's, and, and um, you know, that the, they could, the other doctors could see the results, which spoke themselves. And you, you never get results like that with drugs. So um, I think they started to get a little bit interested in, in what was going on. And so the results... Um, they so if they found that it was possible to re achieve a forty six percent drug free type two diabetes remission rate, and they also achieved significant improvements in weight, blood pressure, and lipid profiles. So that was significant at at, at six years. So was this a rolling um, sort of a rolling analysis because the average patient was on this for twenty three months? Yeah. So. As, as patients joined, they would be sort of tagged in their notes that they were following a low-carbohydrate diet, and then it was that possible to take that whole cohort and keep analysing the data as, as we went along to, to see what happened. And 93% and of patients shifted to a non-diabetic threshold. Yeah. Which, which is amazing. pretty stunning. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, that, I mean, that's why we keep going. You know, we keep saying, you know... Uh, I mean, David's the oldest GP by a mile now <laughs> in Southport, um, and I, I think he. I think it's just so fantastically cheerful medicine that he's, he's oh, not. That he's not cheerful, full fantastically time. cheerful medicine. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it just it just he just wants to keep going. You know, we talk about it occasionally, and then no, he's he's really happy doing what he's doing, and you know, he's, I mean, literally some of some of the um i mean whenever he talks if people want to sort of watch on the internet any of his just google any of the conference presentations that he does he always presents cases because you know it's a real life story is is so resonates with people and you know t totally life-changing you know a lot of young people who were really getting themselves in trouble very very badly controlled blood sugar and we know that you know a, a, a poorly controlled uh blood sugar above 58 as we measure it here i'm not sure whether you do millimoles per mole or percentage um you know you're losing about a third of your life expectancy so when you've got people in their 30s and, and 40s who with these very poorly controlled blood sugars you it's literally a life-saving intervention uh, to do this and they come back so so cheerful and energetic and you know it's not just about their physical health it's about their mental well-being and their ability to kind of engage in in life so it, yeah it's fantastically cheerful medicine and 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 as well you know in 2021 you released another paper renal function in patients following a low carbohydrate diet so mm -hmm. what does that mean for patients when their renal function improves so that that paper came about because um what we've tried to do is address the criticisms of you know people who 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 are not so sure about the the effectiveness and the safety of low carbohydrate diets and one major criticism is that it's very, lots of protein is bad for your kidney function and we know that for people with type 2 diabetes their kidney function tends to worsen over time that's the natural course of things because the diabetes the kidneys are very uh uh vasculated i suppose that would be the word I'm not I'm not a medic, but I'm, no, I've that's... heard David about it, obviously. And so that where where you get vascular changes with with high blood sugar, 
you know the kidneys are one of one of the organs that can suffer uh so we wanted to look at that data and we were just so thrilled really to see that um not only did people's kidney function not worsen uh it it improved that's phenomenal that's amazing it, and it, it's so interesting you know and it you know that that again is another sign that the body you know is healthy and is is um is thriving with this this way of eating a very big big sign and in that same year in 2021 you released the paper dietary strategies for remission of type 2 diabetes now in that paper you said and and you, you put on you put it down you said a, there's a dearth of guideline recommendations regarding mode of delivery of intervention components needed to help people achieve type 2 diabetes remission and and it also said remission should be considered as a treatment goal for people living with type 2 diabetes, um, particularly under six years, if they've had diabetes less than six years. I mean, this is a profound, this would be, if, if this became the recommendations of our health authorities, we would see a profound shift. Mm. Yeah, the idea is people are kind of told, oh, well, you know, it's a chronic condition. This is what David was telling people 12 years ago. Yes. You know, you've got a chronic condition, we'll manage it with meds, um, you know, we'll keep an eye on your eyes and your kidneys and, you know, let's kind of see how it goes. And they might get referred in the UK. There are some um, sort of di type 2 diabetes management programs, but they're really giving the old sort of, um, you know, carbs with every meal. Um, it's really quite a sort of, you know, high high it is quite a high carbohydrate diet so even if people aren't eating sugar this is where i think this whole shift has to come even if they're not eating sugar in the form of it in their tea or having biscuits and cakes you know they may be still having you know a lot of high blood glucose because they're having toast and cornflakes and even porridge and bananas and things like that which digest just digest down into very large amounts of, of glucose so uh and as a yeah. result you get the insulin was, spikes um, so that was uh yeah that was a bit of a game changer in in the uk really that the that was the british dietetic association who were working with us and other people on that um so yeah that that was an exciting shift that low carbohydrate diets are we've seen a real shift over the last sort of 11 years they are becoming more acceptable and you know maybe not everywhere there's somebody who can advise people how to do it but they're now not telling people not to do it if you know what i mean so that's good and people can find information um most people have in the early years have found just found information on the internet or you know followed followed people on the internet so as a part of the, the work reversing type 2 diabetes, people have to change their diet and move from the carbohydrate sort of loaded diet to a, a different diet. And there's a, there's a massive role here in addressing food addiction, but also in the role of hope, the belief that this is, this is going to be possible. What, can you talk to me? Because your expertise is, is in working with hope. Yeah, this is, this is really my sort of, um, professional well personal and professional passion really is that is the importance of the role of hope in in health outcomes i mean it, all outcomes really but you know we know that people who are higher in hope take less pain medication consult doctors less um literally live longer so that's so fascinating isn't it that this psychological variable can have such an impact on our on our lives and you know, it sounds a bit kind of woolly, but but actually you can operationalize this idea of hope. And because you can do that, then you can sort of um, do hope enhancing interventions to to help people become more ho hopeful about their own health. And then they become sort of self, um, not even maintaining, but, you know, that they're able to sort of see that they can make changes and what difference that makes and that encourages them to make more changes it makes them more confident around their own health and sort of well-being and then they yeah then then they become you know their own their own coaches in a way so yeah that's that's really what i i think medicine is missing a lot of the time and it's what we've 
you know, but because it, because we're a doctor and a psychologist pair, we've been able to sort of combine together together in this in this work. Um, and I, you know, I I like to think that you know we we would have got good results anyway. Just just really counselling people to try and uptake this way of eating. But I think perhaps the way the message has, has been delivered has has added that that extra effectiveness and David's got really really good at it um really good at sort of that delivery on a one-to-one -one, but also also in a group setting and just uh, and a quick a quick question while we're talking about this uh a GP asked me to say how do you sustain it how psychologically and I think it's important we have this conversation while we're discussing mm -hmm. about the young one surgery how do you sustain that how do you help people sustain this, this mm. shift yeah so the first thing is before you ever start giving anyone any information never start with information or advice because we all know that if information and advice was effective nobody would smoke and nobody would eat loads of sugar because we've all got that information we all know that smoking is bad for us we all know that ultra processed foods and sugars are bad for us so you you're never gonna and this is what where a lot of health professionals um get in a bit of a pickle really because they'll say well what what you need to do is eat this low carbohydrate diet or stop smoking and your health's going to improve well we, we just know that 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 doesn't work so we always start with right what are the person's goal you know what's important to them and what are their goals where what would what does hope you know what are their best hopes and what does that look like and try and help to engage them in this sense of a preferred future you know that if you were able to reverse your diabetes you know what what difference would that make to you and we get all kinds of things like well you know I, I really want to be able to play with the grandkids in the park you know I'm a bit breathless at the minute so I can't do that or you know because I need to lose weight and all of that but that's the that's the hope or um you know, I'm about to retire and I want to have a healthy retirement with my husband. We plan to do lots of traveling. You know, it's going to be so much better if my health's better. So trying to engage people and really hook them into that sort of preferred future is actually where you have to start. Um, and then it's about um, trying to sort of engage them in, well, you know, what are the successes have they had in life? What are their strengths? Who's supporting them? All of that stuff that it's going to make them more confident that they can make a change reinforce what they're trying to achieve yeah re well reinforce their self-confidence really and their ability i think people often feel really hopeless about diet <laughs> you yeah. know they've tried they failed they've done this scheme that scheme the other scheme and they've kind of kind of given up really trying to stick to it um so we you know what what else have they been successful at have they lost weight in the past have they ever given up smoking or you know other other sort of you know what and who's on their side who's supporting them we we'll sort of go through all that so then they've got a sense of where they want to get to and some sense that actually they're a competent human being who's able to achieve their goals and then it's about some really tiny little shifts so you know what if you know what's this what's the smallest change that you could you know you feel confident about making this week um or you know what would you like to be able to tell me next time you see me uh david often does that because people love to come back and tell you about their success and then you're kind of in their head as well when they're around at home and they're about to reach for something they're like oh no i've got to go and see dr unwin on monday and tell him how i'm doing you know so um uh and then tiny changes mean that then there's that little increasing confidence when there's that bit of success and then it becomes a, a sort of virtuous cycle. And then the other thing is that once they've managed to do this low carbohydrate thing for a short time, they experience the magic of how well they feel and how they don't feel hungry. And often that's the first time in people's lives that they've ever felt, <laughs> ever felt that way. And then that becomes part of the sustaining story. And now they nearly always do have a slip or a, a, a lapse um because we're all human 
and but actually then we incorporate that into the learning and we say well you know how how do you feel now they always feel worse you know how did you feel before well i felt better um you know what are your goals and sort of reinforce that and then then it's about the person really seeing really making that choice for themselves actually for i feel better when i do this i see my weight coming down all those health of uh, you know factors that we were talking about they're all improving so it becomes a bit of a, a no-brainer really and we do we do all slip and fall but it's a learning it's not a failure it's a it's a learning experience so people don't need to feel bad they just need to kind of think well what would i do what would i do differently next time i was in that scenario where i had a slip up um and so it's it's this sort of iterative process of trying something out getting some feedback um you know keep doing what's working and and that has to be quite a long term ongoing thing i think people want this sort of quick fix around health often and um there's never going to be any quick fixes because it is about our own behavior but we need to support people in the long term so our group is still going we've still got people in that group who were there right at the beginning 11 12 years wow. ago and so yeah, they still, they still come we do it monthly now so they still come monthly and they support other people coming forwards and they say, you know, this was me. They bring the photo. This was me 11 years ago and I've come off all this medication and they're still coming back to support others. And to obviously we keep trying to introduce new information and talk about things that are going on in the in the world of low carbohydrate and type 2 diabetes reversal. So um, the, the long term support is really important because it is human nature to to slip back and. I know we're going to talk about the fact that, you know, ultra processed foods, sugars uh, and uh, refined grains have an addictive effect in the brain. So we're all going to be tempted to go back to them. And the environment we live in is is crazy triggering because it's everywhere, <laughs> you know, That's... compared to when we were children. It's I mean, really, it's so yeah. hard to I mean, it's a miracle any anyone hasn't got type 2 diabetes and obesity yeah 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 (laughs) Yeah. and if so just going back to your patients in when they start on this this journey do they start off you know reporting in weekly or do they go straight to the monthly now i mean really it's very individual um depending on their situation and and you know what's going on so um David tends to, you know, um, see them one to one to get them going <laughs> with that sort of conversation, and also describe to them what they're doing and take all the um, do all the tests and the measurements and so on. And then he he will he will judge at what point they need to come back, and then they come to the group if they if they choose to. And of course, some people don't like that kind of thing, so that's fine. Uh, some people love it, so it, it it really it really suits them. But and, um, yeah, and is there a like an Unwin Clinic Facebook group that now has thousands of followers. <laughs> so we've got um, what we've got is um, someone who helps us out, who's a, a health coach, and she runs a WhatsApp group for the group. Fantastic. So yeah. they so they constant... share recipes and they yeah they can me- message each other and say you know help this is happening or you know share the successes as well. So yeah, it is nice to have. Uh, to have something something like that where people can uh, contact each other absolutely and- absolutely and just the re uh, you know because there's so much education when you stop cheating inverted commas as in you have the easy rice and you have the easy bread and you have the easy sugar and you start thinking about how do I nourish myself and feel happy about myself there's a massive amount of skills that you need to acquire you know I yeah. used to I used to make pasta that was 90% pasta, 10% whatever. Now I'm the opposite way around, you know, and it's just all those little tips that that change, that that help Good. with that. Yeah, what you, you know, we get some such common questions like, you know, uh, um, what do I take to work for lunch? You know, what what what, <laughs> what do I have for breakfast? <clears throat> yeah, and we t- so we talk about all, all of that and we obviously give them resources and, We've we've done some recipe books with the lovely cow daisies over here in the in the UK. So we you know we recommend those. 
and sometimes we do little bits of cooking actually in the in the group <laughs> we have taken the microwave and various things in with us so we can show people how to how to do various things and we always take some sort of um every every month there's a there's a recipe and a sample of whatever it is like a little frittata or something like that so we you know we we encourage people to to try yeah it's certainly easier if people are good cooks they can they can usually get it actually they usually and often people are foodies so that's good they they understand how to how to cook meats as well as and fish and eggs as well as other things and they just as you say you adapt accordingly and it's a journey to realizing how much you're sort of loving yourself when you cook for yourself and and that's part of the journey in diabetes because people have probably had a lot of not self-love so actually learning that they they actually do this for themselves I think does that make sense absolutely and for the family if they happen to be the one that's uh, catering for the for the family you know you you want to feed your family good nutrient dense uh, nutrient dense food and then uh, what we found is that that you know it's a bit like a virus this low carb thing yeah like one person starts doing it in the family and then the other pe people start seeing you know how how well they are and um how delicious the food looks and so on and it's sort of it, it's it sort of passes from person to person and how about the families that are lower income what's the the affordability how does that work uh, yeah and, and we're often asked that and we've asked because it's not a rich it's not a you know that it's not a rich population where where right. the practice is <clears throat> so we've asked people you know you know honestly in terms of budgeting you know how how is this going and they say you know honestly it's probably about the same it's not more expensive because you're not buying uh i don't know if you have dominoes over there yeah. the dominoes is a pizza chain over here oh uh, you're not buying your dominoes and your your latte you know your frappuccinos and your all of these things that that you know cost a, a lot of money and the sort of things that you can um base base the sort of daily diet on things like eggs and butter and cream you know they're actually all pretty affordable in terms of calories per <laughs> per per pound um and you know we do talk about things you can many things you can do with mints <laughs> and with uh, with minced beef Mince is um, amazing yeah it is amazing and um so, you know other cuts of meat that people can slow cook or you know so so th there are ways of of doing it and they yeah the patients honestly say I do, it doesn't cost us any any more than it than it did that that's a worry because of obviously this idea that the high protein bit is expensive that's um, really interesting i mean but then they create they're craving less they're snacking less so they're they're actually carving out their day which was before focused on getting another snack so that must be yeah. part of it yeah, people eat less often. You know, we often, we often find that people end ends up eating twice a day, and that's what's happened to us. You know, we've kind of dropped drop breakfast now, and we don't eat until we're hungry, which might be sort of noonish, and then we'll have another meal, um, maybe five or six six ish in the evening, and 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 that's the end of it. And and that is always different by age group and development and growth phase and all this sort of thing. Um, and one of the most exciting things, if if policy planners are looking at listening to to us today is that the average norwood surgery spend was four pounds 94 per patient per year on drugs for diabetes compared with 11 pounds 30 for local practices and in the year ending 2022 your surgery spent 68,353 per year less than average so yeah. this is this translates to a massive savings in drugs yeah, yeah. So that's drugs for diabetes alone, but yes, people are yes. coming off antidepressants, antihypertensives, you know, lo lots of other uh, drugs. And also, I mean, we've obviously never been able to sort of quantify this, but people are healthier. So yes. they're not coming back to the practice for other things. You know, they're they're getting on with they're getting on with their lives. So there is a, a, a really big economic uh, impact if it was replicated somebody worked out if it was replicated across the uk how many millions and millions would would be saved um i can't remember the exact figure now but yeah it's 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 significant yeah there was improved diabetic control for 97 percent of those interested in the approach that was sustained for an average of 33 months which is quite a long time 
and the younger diabetics, this is really interesting for, for, for policy reasons, and the lower HbA1c group were far more likely to achieve remission. So it, it feels like there's low hanging fruit there. That oh, can... yeah. Get, you know, the main message coming out of that latest paper is if get the, get in there early. Why aren't people being, you know, in the UK, pre-diabetic, you know, they pick it up on a blood test, but nobody does anything. They just say, oh, we'll monitor you. <laughs> if if people were counselled at that, at that point and encouraged, you know, before they're on medication, that it's is a preventative or, or also you know if, if if it is that someone's only found at the point where they already have the sort of di diabetic level of, of blood sugars within the first year you know it's highly highly likely and people are really motivated at that point that's the thing i think i think people who haven't done this approach say oh my patients wouldn't do that or you know <laughs> uh mine aren't as motivated as yours or something no they're just human beings they're the same kind of people that that we see it's just that at that at that point there and if you give them a choice so david's been doing this the whole time would today you know we could start lifelong medication or we could try a lifestyle approach which would you like to do you know you can do either and i think there's Sorry. It's been one person in 11 years who said, I'll take the drugs. <laughs> and when he says lifelong, you know, lifelong medication, does he say it's not, it will just not be one medication because of the complexity of the disease process here? Yeah, I think it depends how, what the blood sugars are like when he first sees them. But uh, the, the, his, I think his normal conversation goes something like, you know, we could start metformin today, but, you know, it has got a side effect of diarrhea. <laughs> so it's not really selling it to them but this is this is called <laughs> informed Jen. exactly you have to give people that's the point and he's he's really you know kind of up in arms about the fact that you know we if you're going to have a little wart or something taken off you have informed consent any sort of procedure like that is what are the pros and cons and what are the risks but you can start somebody on lifelong medication for diabetes or antidepressants or, you know, any of these actually, you know, it's quite, um, that's quite a serious decision, but there isn't the time given to proper in, informed consent. And there, there really, really should be because there are, there are risks with all, any, you know, with any medication that people might want to take an alternative course. And because the disease will progress, and that is part of the that is part of the drug failure. You know, we it, we, it might control in you know glucose levels, but it doesn't actually stop the you know the disease progression. And you know, I mean, and it's also important to let other clinics know that you know that your prescribing savings for that practice for your practice is less than half the the area average. That's that's powerful. You know, and 77% of patients achieve remission, which is, you know, I don't, I don't think if you had said this to any of the practices around you that they would believe that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, it is the issue of how do you change? So we're talking about how do you change patients' behaviour? How do you change clin clinicians' behaviour is the next challenge because clearly, clearly it works. And in fact, there's more and more evidence. It's obviously not just us, is it? But, you know, there's more and more evidence that this this does work is an effective intervention. But then how do we how do we get other practices to um, and this is the work that's been done now, isn't it? it with um, Karen and, and uh, Grant Schofield yeah. down there in zealand is how do you then how do you roll this out because we know we know that it works how do you get clinicians to change their behavior because they're so stuck in this sort of way of working with people with type 2 diabetes absolutely absolutely and would you recommend that uh, clinicians would go to a certain food addiction conference to help them understand that food addiction is a real issue that um, requires um, paying a little bit more attention to yeah, so this is the this sort of uh, the the part of the story that we haven't really spoken about yet. But obviously, people do, and a certain proportion of people really. So a proportion of people will get this information. They get the diet sheet off. They go. They get it. They do it. They feel fine. They stick to it. Um, there's a group in the middle that need a bit more support, and then then there's a proportion of of people, and it's quite. Uh, we're not exactly sure what proportion of people with type two diabetes, but um, people with um 
food addiction are seven times more likely to be type two diabetic. There was a study wow. out a while ago. And um, there is, you know, there was one study that showed that 70% of people with type two diabetes have a food addiction problem. And whenever we ask about it in our group, if there's 20 people there, about 18 of them will put their hands up if I do the screening questions for, for food addiction. So uh, this is the next sort of um, big push really is getting this condition recognized by the World Health Organization or the American Psychiatric Association as a as a legitimate condition worthy of you know treatment research and 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 screening so um you know david says now that he he sees people with food dish problem in, in every, every clinic that he does basically and so what we need to do for those people is to have some yeah, some some sort of ways of talking to them about that and what what you do about that and some effective interventions so yes we've we, I, me, and some other colleagues, not with David, have done have done uh, research on on this topic. Can we can we design an effective intervention? Uh, we think we can, and and also trying to get consensus amongst the world experts on that because there is quite quite a lot now of research on food addiction, and there's a lot of none in New about. Zealand, Jen. None in yeah, New Zealand. Yeah, in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. No, we weren't able to. So we've been doing a consensus process with as many international experts as as we can. Um, no, we didn't. We didn't find anyone in New Zealand yet. But I think Grant's quite interested in doing some research on this topic. Um, so on May the 17th in London, we've got a one day conference to launch this agreed consensus between all these international experts, which is super exciting. And a lot of them are coming to to speak. So it's the first time all of these amazing people have been in one place. So we've got Robert Lustig, who everyone's uh, kind of heard of. Nicola Veen has done a massive amount of work in in the food addiction space. Uh, we've got Michael Moss, who's actually an investigative journalist who wrote the book Hooked, which is all about how is it that the food industry got us all hooked on these on these foods? Um, yeah, uh, Anna Lemka, who's an expert in dopamine um, and addiction. So um, they'll all be speaking and we'll we'll kind of launch this consensus. And it's part of our next steps to try and get the World Health Organization to, to recognize this condition. Now, it won't be very convenient for anyone from New Zealand to come for London, to London for that, unless they're already coming. Um, but there's a live stream ticket option. And um, again, you probably wouldn't want to stay up and watch it live stream because it's going to be all through the night for you guys. But that you would then get the videos. <clears throat> you could watch it um, as soon afterwards as we could send you the videos and you'll, you'll hear the latest on, on food addiction. And what is that? What's the URL for that? Uh, it's on Eventbrite, so I can I can send you the the link, and you can maybe post right. it with the note. I will but do that. if people went on Eventbrite and searched for food addiction in okay. London, it always does it by location, doesn't it? So food addiction in London, um, you'd find it. Or if you follow me on X, and I'm just Dr. Jen Unwin, I'm posting about it all the time. <laughs> Obviously, um, we have ne we have nearly. We're not far off filling the auditorium, but there's there's unlimited live stream tickets if uh, if anybody wants to to listen. And before we finish this part of our interview, you've also written a book called Fork in the Road. Might that interview that might that be, book be useful for people that are thinking about changing their diet to reverse type two diabetes? So that one was particularly written um, for people who think they might have a food addiction. So maybe that. You know that if you've got type two diabetes and you've tried and failed to give up sugar, it may be that you think that 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 applies to you, um, and it is really just a book for the general public on on the topic of food addiction and, and what to do about it. Um, if people are wanting a book specifically on type two diabetes and and how to reverse it. These recipe books that we've written with the Caldeses, which is C-A-L-D-E-S-I, a few of those are how to how to do it. And it's got Dave, David's written quite a, a big introduction on why it works and, and how it works. And then there's some amazing, amazing recipes. So there's a few in that series. Um, some of them aimed at type 2 diabetes, some are aimed at weight loss. Um, but that's probably a, a nice sort of 
easy easy place to start if you like and um just just to make the note that if people are on medication for type 2 diabetes or for high blood pressure uh please talk to your healthcare provider before you do anything too radical to your diet because if you're uh if if you go low carbohydrate your blood pressure and your blood sugars will drop and there can be some ad adverse reactions with some of the drugs for diabetes where we don't want we don't want anyone getting in into a into a pickle and also if your blood pressure comes down and you're on blood pressure medication obviously you can your blood pressure can go too low so that's um, a, yeah that's important thank you and thank you for talking about your practice that you've been the, the your husband's practice and your work in regards to helping people shift away from um, ultra processed diets because that's that's what they'll have been on so thank you so much you're welcome